Lake Forest Podcast is supported by viewers, listeners, and businesses just like you. Michelle Pardo has lived and worked in Lake Forest for over two decades. Michelle's lending experience when combined with her real estate expertise makes her an invaluable asset to her clients as they navigate their home buying or selling process. Call Michelle now at 847-528-8721, 847-528-8721. For the best cannabis in the world, look no further than Iliad Epic Grow. Owned by Lake Bluff's own Rich Ruzich, they are a cannabis cultivation center focusing on hard-to-find small batch products that will delight both the occasional user and Ganjier. When visiting Michigan, ask for it by name, Epic Products, Exceptional Process. For more information, email info at iliadgrow.com. Laracy and Company CPAs, founded in 2010 by Lake Forest's own Brian Laracy, specializes in tax preparation and bookkeeping services. Earning the People Love Us on Yelp Award, their process is straightforward. Just upload, review, and file. For a free quote, visit LaracyCPA.com now. That's L-A-R-I-S-E-Y-C-P-A.com. I'm excited to share with you something special from our Lake Forest community, the Aesthetic Lounge Med Spa, located at 775 North Bank Lane in Lake Forest near Wisconsin Avenue. This just isn't any spa. They offer an amazing blend of traditional spa services, plus the added benefit of medical procedures and treatments. In a relaxing and luxurious spa environment, you can enjoy a range of cosmetic and aesthetic treatments. These are all performed under the supervision of top medical professionals. The Aesthetic Lounge Med Spa provides skin care, facial rejuvenation, body contouring, laser hair removal, Botox, dermal fillers, chemical peers, and much more. What's great is that each treatment is tailored not just to enhance your appearance, but also to address specific skin concerns and to promote overall well-being. So if you're looking to pamper yourself and take your beauty routine to the next level, give the Aesthetic Lounge Med Spa a call at 224-768-8028 or visit them at their location on North Bank Lane. It's an experience your skin will thank you for. We'd also like to say we're thankful for our Patreon supporters, Otto, John C., Helen, Herrick, and J.M. Top of the morning. Bottom of the morning. I'm ready for John Kerr. Look at you. Look at you. Oh, I forgot to bring my bear's hat. Oh, well. That's okay. (laughs) Our good friend, uh, Alice Moulton, Eli... Go Pete. ask Alice, because she's 10 feet tall. That's Pete and Joe, uh, nah, she's not 10 feet tall. But she's a long-time uh, loyal watcher and listener from the old I day. appreciate that. And uh, she always lets me know uh, when I'm off track, in her opinion. She sent us a little note. Pete and Joe think... That's why she's emailing you a lot. <laughs> hey, I'll take all the, hey, all the feedback we can... I thought she didn't want her name out there. Uh, this one I can Pete and Joe, okay. thank you for uh, talking with Rep Schneider on today's podcast. I think the ID method to help prevent voter fraud is a good one. And Schneider said that people could get an ID at a post office if needed, but he didn't endorse the idea. He let it drop. Yes, more people voting is a good idea, but it didn't answer the question of how to combat voter fraud. Bringing back absentee voting by mail where one had to answer why... Why he or she couldn't vote in person on voting day would help a lot. In my opinion, I have uh, not been an election judge, so don't know the ins and outs of voting by mail, but it seems too easy a way to ballot stuff. The relative of a friend was an election judge in Michigan and looked up her voting record. She not only had voted in person the day of an election, as she always does, but also had voted in the same election by mail just one known incident like this makes one doubt the method alice moulton eli you know i share some of those concerns um i think there should be an id when people vote i've always i've always felt that yeah um and yeah if you don't have a driver's license there are other ways of getting ids you can get a non-driver's license id from the secretary of state's office um, cause I, I certainly don't want to deny someone who's eligible to vote the right to vote. That is a very basic principle in our country that said, um, look, I grew up in Cook County. You grew up in, in, in Chicago. We all know the stories of what used to happen there, uh, back in the day, uh, with stuff. I mean, you can, uh, 
some argue that John F. Kennedy won the presidential election because of what was going on in Illinois in 1960 with, you know, the Daily Machine. Who knows? Um, so, yeah, I think people should have an ID. Uh, and, you know, I mean, we we had limited time with the congressman last week because there, there, there are things I agreed with him on. There's things I didn't agree with him on. But, you know, we he was a he was good enough to be a guest on our show and. Uh, we had a very limited time window, so I wasn't going to get into a debate with him. Uh, and I'm not running against him. I'm not a candidate. So, Well, I got to get better at asking questions, more pointed, short questions. And that way, when he, when they, <laughs> he's more on his game than I am. I'll give him that. Well, he's been doing this a while now. Yeah. So, you know, yeah. you get, you, you, you do this and you get good at it and he's, he's good. And I think, you know, for look, I, I've made it very clear over the over the time I've been on this show that I'm a I'm a moderate Republican, but I I respect him. I mean, I'm we're going to have Jim Karras on uh, his his Republican opponent, and Jim's a good man. He's a, a former plan commissioner here in Lake Forest. I think we'll have uh, a good discussion with him. Um, but you know, I for a Democrat, Brad is pretty conservative, and this is a guy who um, I think. 25 years ago would have been a Republican congressman yeah. from the North Shore, just like Mark Kirk or, or Bob Dold or John Porter. Uh, going way back, Donald Rumsfeld was the congressman from here. Uh, but, um, you know, the Republican Party, even before Donald Trump, has moved much further to the right, particularly on social issues. And we've lost a lot of people like Brad Schneider. Forget that he's a congressman. Think of him. There's a lot of voters like Brad Schneider that used to vote mm. for Republicans that don't anymore in this area. Yeah. Um, and that is that's a that's a textbook example. And I think we need to think about that. I mean, the, if the Southern strategy works in the South and running more conservative candidates in other parts of the country or other parts of Illinois works great, mm. but it doesn't work here. Just telling you, but back to back to Alice's question. Um, yeah, I think there should be voter ID. Um, I do, I do think I'm not into the whole conspiracy that the that the election was stolen from Donald Trump. Um, it was stolen but, from Clinton? Oh, from Hillary Clinton in, in oh, 2016. And, and then, same thing. And then so. Bush and Bush stole it from Al Gore back in the day. Mm -hmm. I mean, every every election seems to be stolen, right? Uh, when you lose. So I, I I think vote by mail is here to stay. And the Republican Party better start. We used to own, I know this because I worked for the Republican Party. We used to own vote by mail. That was our baby. And then they um, came in and, and outmaneuvered us. And then Donald Trump told everybody don't vote by mail. More and that caused, uh, that caused a lot of those issues. I think we have someone coming into the... Uh, to the uh, podcast here. Yeah, we got to get away from this politics stuff. Seriously, we've been talking about you know all that all that crap. Let's get let's talk about some fun stuff like the Bears. That's fun. Lake Forest Scouts and oh, that's fun. Now here <laughs> I go. I'm not so sure if that's going to be fun. I'd like to talk about that <laughs> with with someone. I, well, Kay <laughs> I wish you. I wish we knew an X. One, two, three. I wish we knew an expert that would knew, know something about the uh, Lake Forest Scouts uh, football in uh, yeah. Chicago. Well, let's try it. Let's try what we did last week. I got a guy. <laughs> of course we got a guy. Here. I got Jennifer. a guy. What's going on, yeah. fellas? How we doing? All right, man. Yeah. What's happening? Yes. How are things? John, how are you? Things are good. Things are good. Yeah, yeah. Good to be on with you guys. And we're going to talk a little, uh, what? Uh, talk, talk some bears, right? Little Scouts football. Yeah. Get off. You know, get off politics for yeah. A, yeah. A few we, minutes, we need a right? break. We we need a so break. Even even politics now is getting into the Bears because of the whole stadium debate now. So, yeah, you detected that there's there was a little hint of of sarcasm in, in my voice <laughs> there because yeah, it's it's impossible. Even even the Bears have managed to kind of screw up having the top pick in the draft, right? <laughs> Before we slam Caleb, or at least I will, that stadium thing. You said all along they're staying in Chicago. John Kerr, are you sure you don't think they're putting that four billion plan up there just to get the taxes down in Arlington Heights? I still think they're going to find a way to be in Chicago. 
Okay. I, 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 despite all of the posturing, and this is no inside information on, on my part or anything. It's yeah. just understanding. Maybe. Yeah. First of all, how uh, the history of how, how politics work in this state and how deals get done. And, and I feel like the initial response from the politicians, meaning certainly Pritzker, Welsh, you know, all the you know, other, all the congressmen certainly are, are legislatures in the state of Illinois. They, you know, they were being politically prudent by making those comments in this environment. Um, but I think the Bears know something, and I, I feel like they would not have made such a big show of this unless they either realize that hey, that somehow somebody has told them that we'll find a way to get this thing done, or that maybe there's some federal money coming down the road. Uh, maybe there'll be a $900 million or a billion dollars in some kind of a stimulus plan that might, a gift from the Biden administration to the state of Illinois. Not saying that's the case, um, but I- Because federal I, money's free, right? It's free money, oh, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. And at the end of the day, guys, this is what it's, 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 <laughs> it's free money, right? I mean, I know, I know, look, I know both of you guys are are, are fans of early 90s hip hop and, and rap, right? You might remember- Sure. The band Naughty by Nature. They had hit songs. Yeah, I actually do remember them. OPP. Run uh, DMC. Property. <laughs> that's right. right. And so that's Kevin Warren is the one rapping that song right now. Right. And uh, he's 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 down with it, as they as the kids <laughs> used to say back in the early 90s. Um, and I think that's what the Bears were thinking. Hey, if we can somehow finance this with a billion dollars of other people's money or other people's property, then let's at least explore that. And we already spent two hundred million dollars in in suburban Cook County, Arlington Heights. But uh, let's until we get the tax situation straightened out here, you know, let's see if we can do something. That look, everybody wants it. It would be a great thing to have. It's just it's it's expensive. Well, I'm going to put my tin foil hat on. And part of what scared them away from Arlington Heights was the Cook County assessor, who's a Chicago Democrat, um, getting. Uh, messing with the assessment so that their tax bill would go dramatically up so maybe that was part of the plan to bring them back to chicago instead of going out to the suburbs i don't know um i still don't think we've seen the last chapter in this in this discussion i think there's going to be more give and take i don't know how you go and ask the state for funding on this and you don't tell the governor of the state ahead of time what you're going to do and he's clearly, at least for now, not on board. Look, I'm not a fan of J.B. Pritzker's, but I, I agree with him on, on what he's saying, at least for now, of, you know, there's other things we'd rather do with this money than spend it on a, a stadium for a pro football team. And now he would like to take that money and spend it on other things. I would like to take that money and lower our taxes on it. So there is that difference of opinion on it. But um I don't know. I mean, and no part or the parking is going to be underneath the stadium. So no tailgating. Um, I I think there's going to be more iterations of this. I like I said personally, I am against, and I love sports as much as anybody, but I am against public funding for pro sports stadiums. I think it was wrong when the White Sox got it. It was wrong when the Bears got it uh, 20, 25 years ago when they turned Soldier Field into that horrendous uh, spaceship looking thing to preserve the columns. Um, SoFi Stadium out in LA, uh, brand new dome stadium or whatever out there is is privately funded. So this can be privately funded. Now they have two NFL teams there, Rams and Chargers. Uh, just and but it's not in the city of Los Angeles. I think it's in Englewood or one of those suburbs. So the idea that the Bear that the Chicago Bears have to play in Chicago. Um, isn't necessarily true because the Los Angeles Rams and the Los Angeles Chargers don't play in Los Angeles. The New York Giants and the New York Jets don't play in New York. The Dallas Cowboys don't play in Dallas. I, I could run down a whole list of um, teams that have bolted for the suburbs. The Atlanta Braves and baseball are now in the suburbs. So, Every, yeah, the majority of them do not play in the city. Yeah, I think is what you're saying. I ain't got no tinfoil hat. What I, I, <laughs> I got the thinking I, cap. <laughs> I just got my thinking cap on. As, as far as Pritzker, me thinks he does protest too much. Like you well, said, like I said, for now, for, for now, I agree with him. But I have a, you know, I'm not holding my breath that he keeps that same position because he's he's done that on other issues where he 
shucks and jives around. Uh, so, so, so you make this complex just from a, you know, a beer drinking bear fan. I, look, I'm the biggest bandwagon guy. You know, if, if they're going to Super Bowl, I have always been a Bears fan my whole life. But getting in and out of that place is a pain in the ass. How are you going to change that? I don't want to go through that crap, right? So I, 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 I don't see that changing things. You know, at least you have infrastructure for the trains over there by Arlington. I don't know. Why do we want to reward the Bears management by giving them a billion dollars for their crappy performance, Mr. Kerr? No, I and Pete, this is you know, this is your show, so interrupt me. Uh no, 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 no. Come Especially on. Especially when you have your thinking cap on there, um, which is uh it's I, I I'm intimidated by your intellect, you know, when you <laughs> you're normal normal situations, but certainly now when you're wearing that cap. Um, I think you, you just said it, Pete. I think is the fact. All of these um, stadium plants, regardless of whether it's happening in Chicago or other franchises, all these are, are you're basically an, annuitizing the inheritors of the estates of these teams, right? That's We've seen it happen over and over and over again, where franchises, legacy families, they get public money to build these stadiums, and then they sell the team, right? And so I think the estimation of this that the Bears franchise will be certainly worth several more billion dollars if they get this stadium. And yeah, if you're the Bears, I mean that's that's a great deal, right? If you're the McCaskey uh, a family and and you've and you're thinking, hey, I'm thinking about I'm, I'm going to cash in and get my whatever amount that would be because there's like twelve or thirteen of them. You know, there's there's quite a few of them. I'm not sure what the state taxes would look like. It'd be probably complicated. Um, so you have to ask yourselves, yeah, I mean, as, as a as a taxpayer, how comfortable I am doing that. And then also it's like it's to me, it's it, you're, you're also it's not even so much the cost of this the initial cost. It's the servicing of the previous debt. People forget there's there's a half a billion dollars of, of previous debt on the first iteration in 2003 that hasn't been paid. So I think when you really run the numbers on this, uh, it doesn't make a lot of sense. Um, um, but again, I, I think they'll 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 find a way to make it happen at some point. Well, if, I don't, if this I gets, don't, you don't hire Kevin Warren, right? To, uh, unless he's gonna he's gonna cut a deal. If, if this gets the McCaskies to sell the team, maybe I would support it because <laughs> I, I just don't I don't see a path to a Super Bowl win. Um, with the McCaskies continuing to own the team, but that's that's a discussion for another. Everybody that I've talked to about this, guys, I mean, friends of mine that are Bears season ticket holes, they they actually want to stay in Chicago. You know, they actually like the tradition of going down there, right? Yeah, they kind of like the tailgate. They kind of like the the same people you see every year. As somebody who had season tickets to Cubs games for a long time, and even to, to Blackhawks games for about five years, same kind of a thing. Um, I was down there Saturday night at a soccer game, a Chicago Fire soccer game. There are quite a few less people there than there were at a football game, probably about you know 10,000. And it was nice to be able to walk around and, and have open concourses. And although I did reach a new milestone, guys, in my concession purchases, I paid $10.62 for a hot dog. So I finally crossed that threshold. Uh, I don't know when that's going to end. I'm, I'm just... <laughs> I'm waiting for the summer where it's just going to be $22 for a tall boy. And I'm like, when is enough going to be enough? Um, and all it was was just a, a, a really a, a small hot dog with a white bun. Nothing else. No, no condiments. I get, I get, I get, I get nothing with it. I didn't get like even a bag of fruit loops, like nothing with it. Um, so yeah, I, 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 at the end of the day, guys, I think it's there, there's a lot of unanswered questions and I think those hopefully will, will know more information about this in the coming months. Um, Cause I think this thing is not going to go away. John, are you going to buy a uh, number 13 jersey? I am not. For myself, Pete, for my own very small collection of, as I'm looking over to my right, I have a, I, I have a Joe Theismann uh, number seven jersey. I have a John Riggins number 44 jersey. So you guys kind of know my... The well, you grew up in uh, the Washington, D.C. area, a Redskins, <laughs> now Commanders... Uh, fan, <laughs> so that that explains it to our to our listeners here. But, correct, they correct. got the right quarter. But, well, they got the better. Hear your thoughts, Pete. You said you're not gonna you're not gonna get Caleb any love. You're the you're the expert. I want to hear you before I go off. 
I, th- I think they got it right. I don't know how you can't uh, say that the that the Bears did not get this right. As somebody who has who who covered the team in the late '90s and the 2000s and saw the Cade McNown disaster, uh, the you know Curtis Enos disaster. Although he had a great rookie year, I remember being in Platteville in 1999 uh, as a as a young reporter in my we'll say mid 20s at that particular yep. time, uh, and and seeing uh, Curtis Enos show up in a military size like Range Rover and was wearing military fatigues looked like he had just uh he looked like Pat Tillman uh you know you know coming yeah. out of this thing and we all knew something was off with this young man it's a it's tragic what happened to him right. but it gets you an insight as to how the Bears draft choices went back in those days and Cade McNown was just a, a a total uh disaster as well so I feel they got this right just because I think Williams fits what they're trying to do offensively. And it feels like that they are finally guys based on their drafting of Adunze and the signings that even if they lose, if this team loses 10, 11 games, they're going to score points. They're not going to be boring. And it seems like they're finally loading up on offensive skill guys, which the rest of the league has been doing for a long time. So whether or not Williams will work out, I think he fits what the Bears want to do right now. And he was the best quarterback in that draft in terms of, you know, skill set, his ability to be able to uh, process information, to be able to throw deep balls. How will he handle the kind of November, December kind of chilly weather coming from warm weather states? We'll we'll see. Um, but he's got a lot of weapons, and I, it's it's hard not to be very optimistic right now, even for the most pessimistic of Bears fans. But John, can the Bears develop a good quarterback? I mean, we've heard, we've seen this movie before. Whether it was Justin Fields, I mean. Trubisky was drafted ahead of Patrick Mahomes. And a lot of people, including me, think if the Bears had drafted Patrick Mahomes, he wouldn't be the star that he is today because the Bears just aren't good at developing their quarterbacks. And the history of Bears quarterbacks, even Jim McMahon, God love him for winning the Super Bowl, but his career wasn't that great. Besides that, I mean, it was injury plague. I mean, you have to go back to Sid Luckman to find a real, true, great quarterback from the Bears organization. Bobby Douglas. So can they? We love Bobby, um, who still lives here in Lake Forest. Uh, can, can, the, can the Bears turn this around? Can, is, can the new regime do something that all the previous regimes didn't, didn't do right, and that is actually develop a good quarterback? I mean, you have to go into this with some blind faith just based on the previous history that you just described, right? Historically, no. I mean, the answer would be that, that they'll screw this up. Uh, they will turn this uh, quarterback into, um, let's just say, again, another Trubisky, uh, another Justin Fields. Uh, there's just a long, you know, Cade McNown, long list of guys that that were drafted high and picked it and, and didn't work out. I think, again, I think what's different about this particular one and why I think there'd be reason for optimism is that the Bears have surrounded him with skill guys, and they have a quarter, and they hired an offensive coordinator in Shane uh, Waldron who worked with Russell Wilson. Okay, so as somebody who has worked with a quarterback, I think has a similar skill set than Caleb Williams. I mean, I think Bears fans would be very happy if Russell Will, uh, if Caleb Williams becomes Russell Wilson, and the Bears win a Super Bowl in the next five years. Right. We'd all be very, very happy with that. Now the Seahawks had Pete Carroll, who's a Hall of Fame head coach. Matt Eberflus, I think he's a good defense coordinator. I don't know how – I wouldn't quite call him a Hall of Fame head coach yet. Um, but the, the only thing I would not have done, guys, and I, I would not have taken a Dunze at number nine. I, I just feel like that, that you can – I mean, the the Rams last year took a wide receiver in the fifth round whose name is escaping me right now. I think he's Hawaiian or Samoan or – or, or that Puka. Puka. Puka, yes. Yes, Pete. He became like an all rookie uh, offensive player for them, and they found him in the fifth round. Yeah, the Chiefs always find receivers in the fourth, so you can find guys later. I would have liked to have taken like a defensive lineman, somebody uh, to help sort of pair up with um, uh, Montez Sweat a bit. Um, but they have decided to go all in on skill guys. So I think to answer your question, I think there's a mentality now at Hallis Hall that we're going to score points, and that's and that's the NFL now. Yeah. Where I think previously they were kind of piecemealing it. We're going to draft the quarterback. We'll figure out the system around them. And we'll draft some other guys. No, they got Keenan Allen, right? They got DJ Moore. They, they got Adunze. They got Cole Komet. They signed uh, you know, DeAndre Swift. They got skill guys. 
They just needed a quarterback now to kind of go with that. So um, that's why I think I would be a little bit feeling a little more positive about it. But you got to ignore the history or you can't ignore the history. Uh, history says that, you know, that this is not going to go well. Um, but I think they will. I'm not saying they're going to win the division, but they're going to be even if they go nine and eight. God, they're going to be a lot more exciting to watch. And they have been the last, whatever, 20, 25, or 40 years going back to the... Uh, Got nowhere to go but up, pretty much, right? I mean, no doubt, no doubt. Yeah, yeah. Well, they won like eight, didn't they win like eight games last year, guy, or seven games? So they didn't have a oh, terrible year last year, so... Well, they always have that late season surge to save the head coach's job. That's a That that goes back, I remember, with Lovey and a bunch of other coaches that, you know, they, they win like no games or two games, and then... Everyone's talking about firing the coach, and then they win a bunch of games at the end. Not enough to be good to make the playoffs or anything, but enough to save the head coach. Um, for oh, Rex Grossman, season. guys, don't forget Rex Grossman too. Oh. First round draft. Well, at least hey, Rex Grossman at least went to a Super Bowl. You got to give him that. I mean, I don't think it was him. I think it was uh, Erlocker and and um, some of the other guys on that team. But give Rex Grossman at least credit. I mean, until you've been to the dance. All right, are you two done? Okay, number one. He's six foot one. Okay. And that, you know, that's a that's stretching him. That's like hanging from a pole six foot one. Okay. Number two, Notre Dame. I go back to this, man. I go back to this. This. Caleb, I don't think, had a game that was like the Missouri game for Jaden or the Florida game or the Alabama game. And I know that Jaden didn't have a Notre Dame game. Mm. And that's, I go back to Notre Dame game all the time. And I understand it's different, but like the Notre Dame game has to, if I was Chicago and I was Ryan Poles, I would watch that game over and over and over because he bails from the pocket a lot. Excuse me. Um, he bailed from the pocket a lot up the middle. He threw him, threw him a, duff, a, a bunch of different pressures that he struggled with. Is that um, didn't have a great, um, no, it's my buddy. Um, uh, didn't have a, a ton of great pressures that he had a plan for and threw a lot of balls fading backwards. A lot of different NFL looks. That's why I, I, I sit there and I go like, I don't I, I didn't see that from Jaden. Got it. And I understand Jaden won the Heisman, has the Caleb. Yep. And Caleb has been uh, perceived as the number one overall pick for like the last two, three years. And the Utah game last year. Okay. Three interceptions, uh, I want to say, at the at the Notre Dame game, and his demeanor and uh, how he acted uh, after that. He's a, he's one of those athletes. Uh, insert Justin Fields here. Okay, the NFL is not a physical game at the quarterback as it is a mental game. Okay, I didn't look up his Wonderlick scores and all that, but. Any time where there was a hint of pressure, he would try to uh, pull a Johnny Manziel. In the pros, as Mr. Kerr knows, I mean, that is the elite of the elite of the elite. Everybody is fast, okay? To pull that crap in the NFL is going to be tough. Jaden didn't have any of those type of games, okay? I don't know about Phoenix, but I do know J.J. McCarthy in Minnesota, who I think you could have traded down, gotten some more capital, and have like a winner there. So that that's my, my problem. And then the history of the Bears organization and all that. What I will give Caleb is uh, he is a uh, charismatic player. Uh, he can – he can I think he can build camaraderie. Uh and there's a question on that on some of his USC players <laughs> because he, he let them down. But he does know how to cheese for the camera and, and get the endorsement deals and whatnot. That's my problem. It's 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 above the it's above the shoulders, Mr. Kerr. I, I and then the Bears development. It's I, I think we could have gotten a lot more. I think the best pick that they had was the punter from Iowa. That is Caleb. definitely the best pick, I think. Yeah. Yeah. If I, you know, I, I I've got a coffee cup. I, my my parents uh, are, are are Iowans, and uh, that I, I I bought a coffee cup that said "Punting is winning," because that was like a slogan in Iowa City last year. Because he was like their be their best offensive player. There you have it. 
um, the punting aspect. One, not to belabor this too much, guys, but one one uh, counter to Pete's. I think no very astute commentary, and I think you should be skeptical of any quarterback drafted. Again, as a Redskins fan, okay, Commanders, I, I always be the Redskins to me. Yeah. Hopefully, the new ownership will will switch it back. Um, is um, I don't know about Daniels at all. I have I have no clue if he's going to become RG three. I still have PTSD from RG three. A great season 12 years ago, and then he kind of he got hurt and it was never the same. So we just don't know. I think the one thing about Williams, and there's a guy, Michael Lombardi. I don't know if you guys have, have heard of Lombardi or not. He's a former yeah. NFL. He's a great podcast on uh, uh, VSIN, which is a yeah. uh, gambling site. And he's a former uh, NFL executive who doesn't want to get hired again. So he just doesn't care. He, he's honest. And he says that the concerns about Williams is just, again, is the – is can he win over the locker room? Because he might be, he's, he, I'm going to say he's a weird guy, but he's a little bit different. Now, I don't know what that means exactly, but can he get grown men to play for him? And so, though, and, and, and that's certainly an, an, an essential aspect to be a quarterback in the NFL. We'll see if, if that shakes down. But I think the height thing to me, I, I don't, I don't give, a, I don't give a rip about the height thing. There are too many examples of guys that are Russell Wilson, you know, Drew Brees. Too many examples of guys that aren't super tall that are successful. Uh, they'll find a way to scheme around that. It's just going to be: are, are, Do the Bears are they invested in being now a team that's going to win with offense and with a defense that's going to complement that? In, in, a, in a league, with the exception of the Chiefs last year, the Chiefs won with defense. But the Chiefs are the Chiefs. You can't compare anybody to the Chiefs. They have the best quarterback of, of this generation. But you're going to win games thirty-one to twenty to twenty-eight. As opposed to trying to squeak out a game, you know, whatever, 20 to 17, yeah. and hope the defense gets enough stops. You got to be able to score from the 80 or the 75. You got to be able to go on long fields in the NFL. Um, and I think, and Williams to me has has all the tools to to you know, make that happen. But there should be a, do- a healthy dose of skepticism. Just <laughs> all the reasons you said. Very, very heavy. <laughs> all right. So. Uh, that's enough of the Bears. Let's talk about the scouts, my friend. Oh, come on. Ditka, let's go. go hey, the punter. I the getting back to the punter. This is an amazing statistic. He has the all-time record of punts within the twenty-yard line, which is what you want a punter to do. That's like I said. I think I think that may be turn out to be the best pick of, of the of the draft for the Bears. To- Tory and- Taylor, generational punter. I mean, you want to you want to get a good player, get a tight end or a punter out of Iowa. And, and linemen, offensive linemen, of course, centers. Um. And, of course, guys, if he becomes a great punter, that tells you that maybe the offense isn't quite working out, right? <laughs> well, didn't uh, <laughs> didn't Caleb text him, like, you won't be punting too much or something? <laughs> right. Although, although I mean, again, again, guys, you guys watched the playoffs last year. The Chiefs had a great punter. The Chiefs had a great kicker. Right. So I, you see, you still need somebody, especially in that kind of cold weather in Chicago, although I'm not going to go all, you know, bears, like all, you know, cold weather bear stuff. That stuff died in the 1988 NFC championship game when Joe Montana came into Soldier Field and threw the ball all over the yard. That doesn't work anymore. I just mean they're situational. I'd much rather have somebody, a team go 90 yards as opposed to 75 or 70 yards. Right. That's just simple math. Uh, and to be able to get him at whatever the sixth round, whatever seventh round, wherever they got him, or fifth round, I can't remember the either way. I want to say uh, fourth. Was it fourth they got him? Okay, yeah, that's pretty high for a punter, but either way, it's uh, no Janikowski it's, in the first round. That's a <laughs> yeah. The Raiders did that, didn't they? Like a few yeah. years ago, right? Janikowski, right? The lefty, right? It's like a big, yeah, big, big, big lefty uh, guy. Uh, all right, the Bears. We're talking way too much about the Bears. The scouts, talk to me. Spring ball, my friend. Who's getting the rides? Uh, who we got to pay attention to? I saw this quarterback. They got a quarterback 6'4", 220, something like that. Is that true, John? Clue us in on the scouts. Yeah, they're talking about their uh, starting quarterback, uh, Danny Van Camp, uh, who will return uh, as a starter this year, presumed starter, along with a pretty you know good-sized junior class. And I think a big story – Again, we'll you know uh, you know we'll come back on and and talk about this probably when you know sometime over the summer when we get to camp is because in high school football in uh, Illinois you know, there isn't technically spring football right so they're not out there I mean they're they're working out they're lifting they're doing their plyos they're 
they're doing those types of things. But guys are playing lacrosse. They're playing baseball. And you know, they're doing as they should be doing in the spring as we look outside. It's a glorious day outside. Go out there and be doing stuff um, and playing um, other sports. But I think that the story of this particular team in 2024 will be it's, it's, a, it's a really large senior class. It's going to be I mean, guys graduated 2025. There's probably about 40, maybe even 45 guys in that group. It's a massive uh, amount of, you know, the, the, the team that going back to the 2021 team, the team made the semifinals had a large Final number four, of seniors, yeah. but, but not this particular group. So uh, th- there'll be, and these are guys that have been playing really since they were sophomores, a lot of three-year guys going into this year. So the good news is out of that thing is they'll have depth and there, and there's plenty of guys who want to play in college and are getting some looks. So you mentioned Danny Van Camp, big, tall kid, big arm, uh, you know, good lacrosse player too. I haven't had, I haven't talked to Danny uh, in, in a few months, so I don't know if lacrosse is also an option for him in terms of college, but he's certainly interested in playing, um, uh, you know, football as well. I think he's getting some Ivy League looks. He's getting some Patriot League looks. Great student. Uh, and he's doing all the things he needs to be doing right now, which is visiting. Because right now, guys, this is a, in the recruiting standpoint, this is kind of like a contact period where you can actually go on a college campus and you can tour. Uh, a lot of the guys have been out visiting spring practices for colleges. It's an opportunity for you and their parents to kind of get to know the school a little bit, talk to the coaches, maybe talk to some professors, just get a sense of the campus. And then in June, or even even in I think in middle of May, that'll be a an, another contact kind of slash evaluation period where the students will get invited to these camps, where then the players can then put the pads on and have a chance to, to go through some drills. And for the coaches to evaluate them in pads and a chance to really kind of see how they respond to their coaching. So that'll be in a, so it's a really important part. I mean, the next really 60 days uh, will we'll, we'll say a lot about kind of where you know, these guys fall. Because up until now, all these coaches have is just their junior tape, right, or some of their sophomore tape. Um, so it's, it's, I would say the guys that are really kind of active right now are Danny, uh, Arjun Jawanda, who is a, uh, uh, you know, uh, junior, uh, center. I mean, sort of rising senior, uh, center. Um, there's also, um, Finn Goodman, uh, defensive lineman played, uh, you know, uh, outside and they're kind of three, three front. He's more of a defensive end. Matthew Samosa, who is also a defensive lineman slash offensive lineman. I think he's more of a defensive lineman in terms of where they're looking at him. Uh, Alex Turlap, uh, who was an offensive lineman, a, a guard uh, for them, um, you know, last year. And there's one other one. I'll make sure I'm not forgetting somebody, somebody's name here, guys. Um, Why are you uh, yeah, looking Tim- it up? Tur- Turlap had a brother, didn't he? Defensive tackle? He did. Okay. Yeah, he did. Uh, Alex Turlap. Uh, who was, a, I'm sorry, not, it was um, Max Turlap, excuse me, Max who was also a great wrestler. Uh, yeah, he was a, a, a bigger guy than than uh, Alex, um, but, uh, but but Alex had a really good junior year and I think wants to pursue, at least is going through the, the steps he needs to do right now. And then uh, Timothy Dan, who was a inside linebacker uh, for them as well, uh, also uh, on the uh, track team here in the spring. So that's a good five guys that are kind of in the process because if you, you guys know this, if you've had kids that have been at this age, it's now's the time to start looking and to start getting even, you know, get away from the computer and get out and visit some campuses, whether it's spring break over the summer, you really got to see kind of what these campuses look like and get a sense of how you would fit uh, at these schools. So uh, there are always every year, there's always a couple of guys that decide late that they might want to play maybe at maybe during their, their senior year, but they're playing catch up. The ones that are now kind of out there doing it. And I'll give these guys credit. They're they're very active on social media. They're posting stuff. They're kind of posting pictures of their visits. Uh, They're in contact with coaches via Twitter, uh, X. Uh, So these are all, this is the modern recruiting now where you got to get out in front of it. You got to use social media to leverage kind of your platform. Um, And I think those guys are showing some real good leadership. And that's a good sign for the year that these guys want to go on to the next level and means that they're going to be motivated to have a really good senior year. Is it as a as a parent though? I um I sometimes wonder about these kids putting so much of their lives out there in public on social media, and now think with all guys like you, no offense, are are tracking. Hey, so and so visited this college this last weekend. Hmm. Whereas back when we were growing up, the kid went to the college, and only the college knew about it, and maybe his coach. Right. So is that. Is that good for these kids that at a high school level now, everything they do is under the microscope? That's a great question. 
And I, I grapple with that myself as, as some, as a, as a media person. And I mean, I don't, I don't do this full time, like some of these recruiting gurus who work for 24 seven sports or work for rivals who literally, this is their, this is their livelihood, right? Where they're track, they're, they're tracking you know, every five minutes, what's happening on Twitter, what's going on with the portal, uh, checking, you know, Snapchat on TikTok. I mean, they're constantly, you know, borderline stalking these guys, right? Um, or or gals if they're covering, you know, although the the although it's an exception of basketball, there's not as much of. I mean, there's not there's not a companion sport in in, in female and for women as much. Um, I, th- I think I think there's a a a a limit to it. So I think what 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 if you, if you check out these guys, just I mean, Arjun Zawanda, Finn Goodman, Matthew Samosa, Tim Dan, what they're doing I think is appropriate, and it's more professional. Where it's it's there's hey there's a sense of gratitude to these coaches for inviting me to their camp. So let's say you are Cornell, okay, Cornell University, where Finn Goodman went last weekend on a on a visit, uh, a school up in upstate New York uh, in uh, Ithaca, and they invite you to come out for a visit. Well, the first step you would do then is to is is is, is maybe retweet that or repost now. Excuse me. Yeah, sorry, Elon. Make sure I get the. Uh, so, you know, a uh, slogan, right. And, and you repost it saying, Hey, thank you, Cornell university for inviting me to that camp. Nothing wrong with doing that. And I think there's also a sense of kind of competition. You're letting the other, other Ivy league schools know, Hey, oh, by the way, I'm going to be Cornell this weekend. So, Hey, uh, Dartmouth, Princeton, um, you know, Brown, are you interested? I'm just, just kind of letting you know what's going on. So I think there's a leverage aspect to it, which I think you guys know that's business. Nothing wrong with that. Um, and then when you go on the visit, I think he posts like maybe three or four photographs when you're on the field. I know Finn's, Finn's Goodman, uh, uh, Andy Goodman went with him this week, a picture of him kind of with his dad, with the coaches. So there is a little bit of kind of publicity to it as well. Um, so I think that's perfectly okay and appropriate. All right. Now, if you're out with the guys that night and maybe you're doing some stuff and somebody's, I'm not saying that, that this goes on. But if you're doing some of the social aspects to it, nobody needs to see you playing beer pong, yeah. right? At uh, at said somebody somebody's apartment basement that night. And I think guys are much more savvy about that now than they used to. Not saying that's what went on. I doubt it. Knowing Finn, none of that stuff went on at Cornell. He's he's not like that. But I'm saying yeah. is there, there's, a, there's a balance between doing something that's professional, and to your point about sort of revealing a bit too much and being a little bit uh, narcissistic about it. Right. So I think the Lake Forest guys are doing it the right way. There are plenty of guys who do it in a way that's a little bit more about me and where it's more of a posing type uh, type situation. There's definitely a system to it because uh, back in the eighties, when I played, you had Tom Lemming's report, that little stack of paper. And I was lucky to be the right height and weight or whatever, and going to a big enough school where you know, I, I could get it out there, but that's all that you had, you know, if you didn't get, you didn't uh, get noticed there, at least now it's a win-win for the uh, prospect and it's a win for the school because that's a marketing event for both sides. So like, our, our, I'm trying to follow your lead, uh, Mr. Kerr, by being more on X or Twitter. Uh, Cause that seems to be more of the uh, place to go. Go there's the, when I say system, it's like okay, Twitter huddle, uh, getting your little package together because, uh, Mr. Weiss, when you say you know when these kids put these things out there, these kids are possibly getting a ride to uh, I think Arjun. I, the last thing I saw is University of Chicago. I mean mm-hmm. to get heavily subsidized to go at such a fine school. I mean their parents got to be like yeah yeah. We, we go into Florida. <laughs> what is that system? Uh, to Because if you got a kid, you know, ultimately trying to get a ride, you're trying to market your, optimize your, your, your potential. Is it Twitter? Is it huddle? Like what, what do you see? How do they do that? Because uh, like you say, that is a big part of their lives, you know, having to market themselves because Eventually, they want to get some NIL money too, right, John? Yeah, who wouldn't want some of that, uh, uh, you know, industry industry money, right? And uh, I think we're going to see some profit sharing uh, in in college football 
you know, down the road here at, at some point. That's a, that's a different conversation for another time. But to, to your question, Pete, about kind of the system and the process, I think um, I think Twitter or X, I, I just refer to it as kind of Twitter X, yeah. seems to be the platform um, that is the most heavily uh, populated when it comes to recruiting. Because I think just it, it's 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 an easier um, um, ecosystem with which to communicate, which needs to be communicated. You mentioned Huddle. You know, you can you can post your Huddle film on Twitter just as a link. You can drop it in there, and nowadays you can just watch that on your phone, like everybody does. Um, you know, direct messaging I think is a very very popular thing between players and coaches. I know there are guys that will send their hey a coach may DM say hey by the way I need your first semester transcript. Can you send it to me? And the kid's going to have it on his phone, and he can just DM that to the coach. Uh, he can get that that down to the um, uh, admissions office and get that approved, and 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 that process can be you know kind of kind of turnkey that way. I don't know if the other systems, you know, you know, Facebook, Instagram, um, you know, uh, TikTok, maybe a, a, a little bit. Uh, I, I have I, I'm not I'm not I'm not averse in terms of TikTok in terms of how that works and just in in, in any aspect just have half naked people dancing all the time on there right um, I know there's owned more, by the Chinese I, government <laughs> I know there's more uses for it. yes no I'm I'm with you I, I saw, no, I'm, I'm, I'm what's going on here with with with, with that platform and how it, it certainly you know may be banned here uh, I think there's some deal right happened with the Biden administration whatever on on that thing um, but specifically with when it, when it comes to recruiting. Um, I think Twitter is is a popular method of um, uh, uh, communication and the ability to be able to also as a as an athlete to be able to sort of scroll through and and to be able to do your own research and homework on these schools and these coaches, um, I think seems to be a preferred method of uh, communication. I think that's it. Get your film together, part huddle, put it on 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 Twitter. Start researching schools, communicate with these coaches, uh, get them interested in you. You're interested in them. Um, go on these visits. The next step is to get back on campus, get the pads on, see if they like you as a as a football player. Make sure you're taking care of the things you have to take care of, which is your uh, which are your grades. Become a better football player, and then I think the process from there will be uh, you know if there's going to be offers, you know those things won't typically happen maybe until uh, sometime over over the summer. Uh, I don't think you're going to see any real high level division one players on this particular scouts roster. The one who I think could have been a division one player, Nate Williams transferred. He, he went back to uh, uh, Indianapolis. He's somebody who definitely would have gotten some uh, division one looks. These are division three kind of, you know, division one double a, uh, and they kind of have their own rules. It's a little bit more open uh, and it's a little bit more kind of, you know, customized for the individual player. Uh, but it's always a good sign when you see, you know, four or five or six guys that are pursuing this. And it also, it pr provides a good example for the younger guys to see, hey, this is how you're supposed to do it. Uh, this is what's happening in, in recruiting today, guys. Whether you might be a little icky about it, you have to put your name out there. And I don't when see- Women in Rome speak that, Roman, right? I, I get, I get, Pete, do you I don't think- see what, you, Yeah, exactly. I was going to ask Pete, you played Lane Tech High School and then SIU for college uh, football. Um, if this stuff had been going on when you were uh, in high school, Pete, do you think you would have wound up at a at a bigger? No offense to SIU, but would you have wound up at a bigger school than SIU? Yeah, it would be called Statesville. <laughs> <laughs> Down in Joliet. <laughs> if, I, if I had a camera on me back in the day, I mean, I can't. Because, because Mr. Kerr, you're talking about you know these kids are acting well. It's not them posting it. It's their idiot buddies posting that stuff, right? Yeah. They're out there if they want to get the clip. Yeah. I just don't, I, you know, I, re I remember writing about this and doing stories about this when I was, you know, writing for um, the newspaper, you know, back in the kind of, you know, 2000s when Facebook was just sort of become a, a, a public entity. Uh, and, and I think everybody's trying to figure out how to use it. I remember writing stories about about you know college coaches who would who would sort of you know uh, scan Facebook profiles and for looking for any type of nefarious activity, whether it be somebody holding a beer or a drink or you know whatever it might be. I just think uh, young people think are more savvy today about those types of things. And and while every every moment can be broadcast now, right? Meaning everything can be streamed. Um, I'm not saying this is the case uh, across the board. There's certainly guys that are eliminated, 
I think, from schools because of character issues that go beyond just somebody live streaming something that that, that they shouldn't be streaming. Um, I just think nowadays, I think they every moment of these young people's lives now is is on the internet, and I think they're used to being watched all the time, and so they're more comfortable. With 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 sort of the, um, the the back and forth of that, meaning the calibration of what's appropriate, and what's not appropriate. Um, we're of a generation where it's like, yeah, I'm I'm, I'm the same thing with, with with you, Pete. There would definitely be some photographs of me, uh, <laughs> which would eliminate me immediately if if I was just somebody who who you know, you know went to a couple of visits, wanted Ilma Benedictine. Uh, and I'm, and I'm, I'm sure that there was some probably day drinking going on in the car on the way down there to the visit, right? Uh, Allegedly, that kind of stuff. I don't think that kind of stuff goes on anymore now, just because I think kids are 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 are, are more savvy about this type of stuff. Don't drink and drive, kids, please. That's bad. So, your, but, you yeah, wearing, I mean, why don't you wear your little lapel button with that sweatshirt? Can you do that, or is it only with a uh, blazer? It, just saying. Uh, Mr. Kerr, what is a preferred walk-on? Didn't I just see something, uh, one of our local kids going to Northwestern as a preferred walk-on? What is a preferred walk-on, and who am I talking about? Yeah, yeah. So you're talking about a Logan Uline, uh, whom is will be the third member of the Uline uh, family to, to play college football. His older brother, Mac, is... Uh, at Northwestern this year, had a really good spring from from what I heard. He will be in that linebacker rotation for the Wildcats uh, this fall. Older brother Brock, who uh, just finished up his spring at Miami of Ohio. I believe Brock is going to be a sophomore, I think, at least, in my, you know, certainly his third year in college. He's a 2022 graduate. And then you have, then you have Logan, who initially I think had kind of soft committed to Miami of Ohio, but there was always some questions whether that was actually going to happen or not. And then Northwestern came through with their, um, uh, you know, PWO offer, a uh, preferred walk-on offer um, to uh, Logan. So preferred walk-on is basically that you get all the benefits of a scholarship athlete, only you are paying uh, your way to go to school there, which at Northwestern, as last I checked, was not a small amount of money. Uh, but we are happy for Logan. It, it is a somebody who coached him when he was an eighth grader, and to see his rise as a a, a, a eighth grader who who always had confidence, um, but somebody I never thought would necessarily play in college, right? There's some guys you even know in middle school that, you know, they're going to play. I mean, Riley Mills, like we knew that guy was probably going to be an NFL player someday, right? Even when he was in eighth grade. Uh, you know, Logan to me is such a success story and somebody who turned himself into a tremendous leader on that team, one of the toughest kids, three-sport guy, hockey. I, I, I don't know if he's a baseball or lacrosse guy. I know he plays a sport here in the spring. Um, and he's going to join Mac at Northwestern. So as a parent, right, that's kind of a dream, right, to watch your, your boys kind of be on the same team together. Um, and so I think he's going to be more of an offensive lineman. He played defensive line, too, for the scouts. Um, but yeah, that's a, that, that's not an unusual, um, um, event for Lake Forest football guys where they get the preferred walk on. Maybe they have the benefit of, of, of mom and dad can, can, can pay some of that tuition and then they can earn their way into that scholarship at, at, at some point, which would not surprise me if that happens to, to, you know, Logan down the road. And hopefully his grandparents spend their time watching the grandkids play all these things and stay, don't meddle in the Lake Forest mayoral election next year that would be a win-win uh, so, <laughs> there's a little uh, pin. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah i'm guessing logan uh could not care less about uh the mayoral election you're uh, you're more than guessing you're absolutely right but right but we right. do here at the lake uh, yes we do. And, his, and his grandparents and his grandparents certainly do right i mean so there's no question about that well but, they should uh, stick with randy tack then if they if they have their senses well, to him but they yeah. got a they got a lot of work going on at Northwestern. Uh, they're going to have to. Are they going to play ball while they're uh, putting in the updated stadium in there? Anybody know? I think they're going to. I can't. I can't remember. It's the like name. a little stadium by the lake, isn't it? They're they going to have like a temporary stadium. I think I've been there. Yeah, I've actually. I've 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 been down there when I when I took a tour of their about three years ago. I think they they opened their uh, you know football facility. And I was I was fortunate enough to get a tour of the facility, and then and, and the, the stadium, the field was literally right adjacent to where the um, uh, lakefront uh, facility, beautiful facility, 
Uh, and they they held the state lacrosse championships there um, um, for a couple of years. I'm not sure how they're going to how, how they're going to make that work in terms of temporary bleachers. I think they're going to certainly have to have have a capacity that is at least comparable to a Big Ten game. I, I, I read somewhere they're going to try to get twenty or thousand twenty or thirty thousand people there. Uh, I think Ohio State comes to Evanston this year, so I all Whoa. those. All the, <laughs> Buckeye fans are probably not going to be, uh, you know, too. Could they play that? At, why don't they play at Soldier Field? I mean, look, we all know Soldier Field's a dump, but at least it's got sixty-five thousand seats, right? I mean, well, they play um, Wrigley. Um, or Wrigley. I'm guessing the lease arrangement maybe wasn't too favorable to the the folks up there at Evanston. That's my, that's my guess. So they would. I mean, they played a couple uh, games at Wrigley Field over the years. Now with they, the, yeah, they played Iowa. I was there. I was there last year just to see uh, Mr. Taylor, the Bears punter. I think he kicked like twelve times in that game. He was on uh, on the, the, the Iowa won it ten to seven on a on a late field goal, uh, you know, to win that game. So yeah, I think the Soldier Field thing. I don't think that was really a non-starter from what I read. Uh, I think they're going to try to make this thing work for a couple of years with this temporary field. And uh, as I said, I don't think it's going to matter for some of the early games that they play. Some of these non-conference games against Mac schools. But when you're like, if you're Oregon or some of these schools, or not even Oregon, because those fans maybe not travel. I'm talking about Ohio State, Nebraska. Ohio State has always got a huge presence when they come to yeah. Northwestern. I mean, you, you see them. Down, play. You see them in downtown Chicago. All the all the Buckeye shirts and everything. Yeah. And I, well, hell yeah. <laughs> this this ain't Ohio. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, and I usually never, I never, I usually never fail to to you know heckle or if I can throw something at a at a Buckeye a fan guy. So I, I am again, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna bore our listeners with the stories, but they are. And my apologies to all you all Buckeye fans listeners or graduates. They are the worst fan base in the country. All right, so nothing against the school itself. Tremendous school, tremendous program. It's just I've had like three incidents in my life with Ohio State fans that were unprompted, literally them approaching you. Um, and so I can only go based on my personal experience with those Ohio State fans. Um, and they, but they do travel and they do take that attitude with them wherever they travel. I used to work with an Ohio State uh, alumni slash fan, and I. Uh, Second, to everything you just said. Thank you, thank you, well, thank you. I don't, uh, that's a beer one. Everyone night, nuts. Guys. Everyone in the night. office is like, dial it down. We don't care about the Buckeyes. <laughs> Mr. Weiss, stay out of Massillon, Ohio. I don't think you'll. Hey, like I, I love how Ohio votes, man. It's a good red state now, but yeah. No, again, what, tremendous school, tremendous program. It's it's the football fan base yeah. that, that I, I, I can only speak from personal experience. So anyway, enough of that. All right, back to the Redskins or the Guardians or whatever. Speaking of Guardians, <laughs> I've seen uh, they finally are going to let uh, the players wear those helmets, those uh, mushroom helmets in uh, NFL games. Have you guys seen that? Those big. Yeah, the, yes, yes. The Guardian caps. Yeah, yeah. They That's something that typically was reserved for practice games or for practices. Uh, but now you're going to see them during games. I did, re I did read that. Yes, yes. Just as a, you know, as a, 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 the whole safety aspect to it. Um, <clears throat> you know, I think if there's one thing the NFL still has to get, I think, under control is the head injury aspect to it. There, there, there still are. I think everything else has become a, a, a very, very safe sport in terms of other types of injuries. Right. Because of the CBA that happened, I think, in the early part of the 2010s, cut down on practice time, cut down on hitting, and that all kind of trickled down to college and to high school and at the youth level where I coach. We don't see – we we have maybe one concussion every couple of years. So it's never been safer. The equipment is, 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 is you know, so much better. But I think the NFL is taking a leadership role with this uh, because they still see – they still – you guys remember the stuff that happened with Tua – the last couple of years and guys going down and there's supposed to be some kind of communication system. They're supposed to have a doctor that's there, but you know, it, so I think they're, they're, they're attempting to, um, uh, you know, use this guardian cap as a means to say, Hey, we're, you know, we're serious about, uh, about safety. Um, and hopefully that will trickle down more. And the colleges guys are going to be able to have headsets now. So you're not going to see the guys with the crazy signs up now. Right. Remember the whole, you know, <laughs> yeah. Oh, the, 
thing last year, I right? I kind of like those. Those were kind of cool. Yeah, they had a picture of like Fred Sanford or Red Fox or something. What, what you talking about? I'm coming to join you, Elizabeth, right? You have those on the side of Now, I, I don't know if every school, I'm sorry for my really bad Red Fox impression, but I remember what <laughs> It's almost like my favorite show. Half our viewers have no idea who you're talking about. <laughs> what you're talking oh, about? I, I Sorry, that's my that's my Gary. That's, that's different strokes. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, so by yeah, my bad seventy seconds impressions. I'm not sure every team is going to do this, but they 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 have. Um, uh, there is a rule now where now you can you're allowed for electronic communication in colleges. So that will eliminate some of that. So now so so, the, so you'll see the the the. Uh, um, the uh, college quarterbacks, like you see the pro guys do when they can't hear and they have to kind of push the, the helmet to their ears to hear the play call. Um, so you'll see more more of that electronic communication now in the in the college game. But I'm with you. I do kind of miss those uh, kind of wacky, crazy signs. I don't I don't need a, a, a any big speculation or opinion on this, John Kerr, but do you think it should be outlawed? Why Why can't you take video of the hand signals of coaches? Isn't that part of the game? I think it's a spirit of the game um, rather than a rule, right? I, I think there's a difference between, okay, what is technically in the rule book and what is a violation of the competitive spirit? I mean, it's like I'm a baseball guy and, you know, everybody always stole signs, but the Houston Astros did it on steroids with all the stuff they're doing and, you know, was Katie barred the door with all that, and it just crossed the line. Yeah, and, and again, it's kind of like with the Michigan. I think the Astros won the World Series, right? So, and Michigan won the national championship. So, why do you have to do that? And I think it's somebody again. Full disclosure: I'm a Michigan State graduate, so that might explain some of my Ohio State things <laughs> previously for people. I think it's important to you know disclose that. Um, and I don't have the same angst for Michigan as I do for. Ohio State, unlike my Michigan State friends who still live in Michigan, who can't stand Michigan, but that's a, that's a different conversation. Um, I think the the Stallion story is, and I'm still waiting for somebody. This is where I wish we still had a dead spin. We still wish had a Buzzfeed where we had a a a a, a, a digital news organization that could invest resources in this and could talk to people off the record. You know, could use anonymous sources. And get a full, lengthy, 5,000-word story on this and what really, really happened. I don't think we're, I don't think we're ever going to get that. I, I don't know who's going to invest the resource in doing that kind of story because they would take some, some resources. But Pete, to answer your question, I think the issue was Stallions going to a game with a cell phone and directly videotaping the hand signals of the opposing coach. That technically is illegal. That is not in, in the rules. You can set up a video camera, I think, somewhere on the stands, and you can videotape the game and and do those types of things. But to send an assistant in the, for for the sole purpose of videotaping the hand signals, um, I didn't have a problem with it myself because if you're a coach of the opposing team, just be better, change yes. your signals, right? <laughs> right. I mean, oh, but my thing is like, but my whole thing with Michigan was why do that? What I, I but that's but that's Jim Harbaugh. You know, that's why he, he, he was never going to get hired here in Chicago because of his personality. He's too much of a force of nature. The Bears He's would too not. Too much of a winner. Him. Right. God <laughs> forbid. Right? But his personality just would not fit with uh, with what the Bears want. Um, but Habra is one of those guys where it's just like every little edge counts. And and that's that kind of competitive uh, nature um, of, of him. Um, but, yeah, I would like to see more of an accounting of what happened there, Pete. I'm with you. It, it, it didn't bother me as, as 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 much as it was just a. It was to me. It was it was ridiculous that they even did it. And and then you 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 have plenty of talent on that team, right? You're dominating people. Just go beat people. You don't need to bend the rules or break the rules to beat people, especially in that in that fashion. One more touch on the scouts, and then we'll we'll start to wrap up, boys. Uh, I think Scoo Walker, the voice of the. Lake Forest football scouts Ooh. and go scouts. He always First finishes down. the announcement saying, and yes. go scouts. Scouts pass from Denny Van Camp to Van Carline. First down scouts. Uh, check that. <laughs> 30 years. 30 years. 
PA announcer, 30 years. I believe it's 30. 3-0. Scoo, I know you're not watching or listening, but you should come on and you should commemorate your your 30 years up up, up on the show. You know, we'll, we'll make it a politics free show for you. That's but. A, <laughs> Uh, yeah, you're gonna be able to get some, honor. You're gonna yeah. be able to get school off the golf course or off the racquetball course. <laughs> still, uh, well, a, a well dear former fan. mayor tried to have him removed apparently many years ago that we've since learned in some emails oh, um, from shit. his wife. <laughs> yeah, I mean, guys, 30, 30 years is I, I I mean that's a that's a, that's a, that, that's I mean that's a long time to be doing anything, let alone being a being a PA person at at the high school. I you know, school is. Um, uh, having sat next to him many times at basketball games, not a football game. I'm not a press box guy uh, at all, guys. I'm, you know, I want to, I want to hear yeah. the roar of the crowd, smell the grease paint. I, I am, all, I'm a field guy, regardless of the weather or the temperature. And that Lake Forest press box is, is, is again a little too stifling. But every press box, is, at least at the high school level. Right. Uh, but basketball wise, I think is when he really shines. I think he's really good at basketball and and girls and boys to do it for as long as he has. Um, I think he's somebody he should definitely come on. I ho- hopefully he'll get recognized by the administration uh, in some capacity. You know, this year they, um, you know, I when my high school it, they had students doing the announcing and you auditioned and they rotated and I was one of the kids and I did one football game and I'm like. Never again, because it was a lot of work. I mean, you had to, they made us sit and memorize all the numbers and the players. For the, we were playing Libertyville at the time, so I had to learn all the Libertyville uh, athletes. This is back in the 80s. Um, and um, it's a lot of work doing this. You don't just walk into the booth right before game time and, and no. you know, put yourself in front of the mic. I mean, there's a lot of prep. You got to you know, because God forbid you say uh, some kid's name wrong. You know, you're going to hear about it from their parents and and who knows who else. So there's a lot of uh, a lot of prep that goes into that. So my hat is off to well, that's a lot of that that's it. a lot of administrations, a lot of bureaucracy, a lot of you know. Uh, we got to sell more hot dogs on the field. Uh, uh, the well, Brodsky's or, or whatever uh, Jeff Urso's uh, operation, they do a good job catering the, the games now, so that's good. Pushing those orange slushies, uh, w- way to go, Scoo Walker. Uh, this will be the first of many times we, we give you the uh, shout-out. Mr. Mister John Kerr, how can people more learn about you and your media? Well, uh, Pete, uh, they can just uh, go to Google and type in the Kerr Report. Uh, you'll you'll get uh, my weekly column, uh, the Sunday Six. And I love the Sunday Six. I subscribe to it cool. and I read it every Sunday, man. It's great. Awesome, awesome. Appreciate the plug. And it's free. Just type in your email address and you'll you'll be on the list. If you want to read more, just you know, football stuff. The Kerr Report is you know I, I do uh, uh, political writings and current events and that sort of thing. Uh, but football is. Apolitical, we just talk football, and that is Scouts football. So just type in Scouts football newsletter in Google, uh, and it'll come up. Uh, it's a, a both on on uh, uh, Substack. And, uh, yeah, a lot coming up here in the spring as we get to you know, guys. We're about two months away from when camp begins. Uh, so we'll love to come back at some point in the summer when the guys – putting the pads on and kind of give an update on, on, on what's going on at that, at that particular time. And, um, but uh, appreciate you having me on, man. It's always fun to talk, uh, you know, uh, football and, and bears and, and other things happening in the world. And I had a quick fun. one for you, John, because I, I told somebody we were going to have you on this week and I was asked a question that I had no idea how to answer. Who's the most successful athlete in the history of Lake Forest High School? Ooh, uh, the last question of the day. Yeah, yeah. I was asked this and I'm like, I don't know. I mean, oh, has no. anybody made the NFL? Has anybody made the NBA? I mean, I, I don't know this. It'll it'll likely be Riley. If we're having this conversation a year from now, I would say it's Riley Mills because Riley Mills will probably be drafted. Um, up until this, that's a really, really good question. I, 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 See, I, I, I didn't know. Now I, I feel better that you don't know. <laughs> I'm kind of going through my, you know, Rolodex here. Of uh, you could certainly say, I mean, Rob Palenka had a heck of a. I mean, this this is a guy who now is. I mean, in terms of okay, if you want to trace the trajectory of how good were they in high school, 
then the athletic career in college, and then certainly what they did after college, which you can say for thousands of Blake Forest athletes over the years, right, who have gone to be successful in business, great sure. fathers, fathers and moms. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. All that kind of Absolutely. stuff. But Palenka is was a was the all-time leading scorer uh, for a long time until Evan Boudreau and then Asa Thomas, and then went on one uh, won a, a national championship in Michigan, went to another one with the Fab Five, and became a successful agent, Kobe Bryant's agent, and now runs the Lakers. So you could make that argument that it's Rob Palenka on the male side. On the female side, I would say Hallie Douglas, uh, but her – the basketball player for the scouts who graduated in 2020. She's at Wisconsin, but it's incomplete with Holly. I think Holly got injured and has not quite had the college career. I think she hoped. I don't know if she's going to be transferring or not. I, I haven't ran to Billy, uh, you know, lately to sort of ask that. Um, but I would say Holly in terms of, hey, you know, but, but there's probably others that I'm missing on the girls that have played other sports. But that's one that comes to mind. I mean, the school goes back to the 1930s. You know, maybe and maybe Scoot. No, Scoot doesn't go back to the 1930s, but maybe he can. Uh, I think he does. Give us a give us an answer on that because I, yeah, I don't know. Is somebody played in the NFL, MLB, yeah. NBA. That was that was what I was asking. Like I don't know. But Scoot does have kind of a 1930s sort of like yeah. ethos on him, though, right? A little bit. Yeah, you know, does. kind of one of those old broadcasters with, with the fedora hat, you know, and the big microphone, calling the games a little bit. You know, <laughs> out in the first inning, here we go. Let's go. First down. Check make that. sure you go get. Make sure you get some pants and a hot dog, please. Oh, oh and that's an advertisement here for uh, Clorox bleach. And uh, make sure <laughs> if you listen to some of those old clips of that time, those guys would do these live reads. I think Scoo still oh, has an ice box. They still deliver ice chunks to his house. Scoo loves. He gets it right from the. His office is right under the lantern. They just get. They just ship it down the stairs at the yeah. lantern. John. Where does the, where, the delivery guy park his horse? Is, is there space to, <laughs> to do that when he's dropping off the ice? John Kerr, thanks for going over. Thanks, time. John. And the Lake Always. Forest thanks for having me, guys. No wise. All right. Smell you guys later. The Lake Forest Podcast is supported by viewers, listeners, and businesses just like you. Michelle Pardo has lived and worked in Lake Forest for over two decades. Michelle's lending experience when combined with her real estate expertise makes her an invaluable asset to her clients as they navigate their home buying or selling process. Call Michelle now at 847-528-8721, 847-528-8721. For the best cannabis in the world, look no further than Iliad Epic Grow. Owned by Lake Bluff's own Rich Ruzich, they are a cannabis cultivation center focusing on hard to find small batch products that will delight both the occasional user and Ganjie. When visiting Michigan, ask for it by name, Epic Products, Exceptional Process. For more information, email info at iliadgrow.com. Laracy and Company CPAs founded in 2010 by Lake Forest's own Brian Laracy specializes in tax preparation and bookkeeping services. Earning the People Love Us on Yelp Award, their process is straightforward. Just upload, review, and file. For a free quote, visit LaracyCPA.com now. That's L-A-R-I-S-E-Y-C-P-A dot com. I'm excited to share with you something special from our Lake Forest community, the Aesthetic Lounge Med Spa located at 775 North Bank Lane in Lake Forest near Wisconsin Avenue. This just isn't any spa. They offer an amazing blend of traditional spa services plus the added benefit of medical procedures and treatments. In a relaxing and luxurious spa environment, you can enjoy a range of cosmetic and aesthetic treatments. These are all performed under the supervision of top medical professionals. The Aesthetic Lounge Med Spa provides skin care, facial rejuvenation, body contouring, laser hair removal, Botox, dermal fillers, chemical peers, and much more. What's great is that each treatment is tailored not just to enhance your appearance, but also to address specific skin concerns and to promote overall well-being. So if you're looking to pamper yourself and take your beauty routine to the next level, give the Aesthetic Lounge Med Spa a call at 224-768-8028 or visit them at their location on North Bank Lane. It's an experience your skin will thank you for. We'd also like to say we're thankful for our Patreon supporters, Otto, John C., Helen, Herrick, and J.M.